Okay, everybody, let's start this interesting session on uh, uh, biological essays and high throughput screenings. My name is Rina Arbusfeld, and I'll share this, chair this session. We'll start with uh, Professor Hagit Aldar Finkelman that will tell us about novel GSK inhibitors and treating CNS disorders from Tel Aviv University. Please, Hagit. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you, the organizer, for giving me the opportunity to talk about our project. Okay. So initially, the title, uh, as you can see, is focus uh, on GSK3 and our strategy and development GSK3 inhibitors. But recently, we started to expand uh, our strategy that we call the SI strategy toward uh, the family of protein kinases. So I decided to first tell you a little bit about our vision and our what we call size strategy for developing protein kinase inhibitors. And then I will focus about the GSK3 inhibitor that we developed, the results that we have of them and some implications uh, in disease models. So SI is, uh, stands for subset competitive inhibitors, which means that these are type a different type of inhibitors as compared to other type of protein kinase inhibitors uh, that we know. Now, protein kinases uh, are known to play key roles in many, many cellular processes. And development of protein kinase inhibitors uh, is a major theme in, in many drug discovery programs. What you can see here is the protein kinase uh, tree. And you can see that many, and, and what you see here is the protein kinase inhibitors that are in the clinic. So you see the many of those, very interesting to see that many of those inhibitors are inhibitor of protein tyrosine kinases and mainly focus on cancer treatment. There are few protein kinase inhibitors for serotonin kinases. For certain reason, I will not uh, go into it. But the point is that all of those inhibitors are ATP competitive inhibitors. And, and uh, uh, sooner or later, it's found that there are typical uh, prob problems with uh, uh, treating or using ATP competitive inhibitors, uh, mainly due to lack of specificity, problem of safety, and also drug-induced resistance. And therefore, we thought that maybe uh, oh, it's better to try to develop a different type of protein kinase inhibitors that using a different modality of inhibition and this is where our SI uh, strategy uh, comes for. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about the SI and, and about the whole thing. So what you see here is a schematic presentation of protein kinase, in this case GSK3, but they really look very similar. And uh, the structure of protein kinases is, is divided to a, a small N lobe and C lobe, and the reaction is really happening here, actually in the cleft between the two lobes. Now, most of the inhibitors that I mentioned are ATP competitive inhibitors, so these are small molecules that bind to the ATP binding site. Now, the ATP binding site in protein kinases is highly conserved because all kinases bind ATP in phosphorylates. And therefore, as I said, there are certain problems with such inhibitors. We try to look on a different region. What you see here is the region where the substrate binds. And our rationale is that if we will develop substrate competitive inhibitors, we will already have more specificity because the substrate binding region is much more unique or specific to the protein kinase. It also will have uh, additional benefits, as you can see here summarized in this table. So what you see here is the Psi versus the ATP competitive, again Psi substrate competitive inhibitors. So we expect from the size to be highly selective and therefore safer and they will have show low toxicity. They will also will be less prone to drug resistance. This in contrast or in comparison to the ATP competitive inhibitors that, as I mentioned before, has a problem of specificity, safety, and drug resistance. I can mention one example, for example, Glivac, which is well-known uh, drug for CML, 
And Glivac is a, a, an inhibitor for the oncogen uh, BCR ABLE, which is a tyrosine kinase. Now, Glivac is a small ATP competitive inhibitor, as it works wonderful. However, within time of treatment of patients, within four years or so, the patient starts to develop drug resistance to Glivac, and this is due to formation of point mutation in the ATP binding site of ABLE. So, for example, one of our ideas to try to develop substance competitive inhibitors, in this case, as a, a second line of therapy. So, our uh, strategy, or I would say long-term vision, as I said, is to try to expand from GSK3 to protein kinases, and this is the strategy that we already started to work at. So, it says this protocol. First of all, we would like to, of course, to select our protein kinase use its structure. Today, uh, you have, uh, I think, in almost any protein kinase available, you have 3D structure. Hopefully, if we find a structure complex to a substance, that's great. But if not, in any way, we will try to explore the substance binding sites of the kinase, as you can see here. And then synthesize uh, peptides that are derived from some substrates. Of course, test them in the test tube or in biological assays dock the uh, peptide into the substrate binding site, and then we can do two things. We can take two directions. One is to optimize the peptides, and this is kind of the, the crosstalk or ping pong work between the assays and the uh, docking analysis or computational analysis, optimizing the, the sequence of the peptides. The other direction is to build a pharmacophore based on our best peptides and our structure model of the protein kinase with the peptide substrate, use this pharm pharmacophore for virtual screening and obtain, sorry, obtain small molecules that's supposed to actually uh, mimic or copy uh, the interaction of the function of our side peptides. Uh, so this is kind of our long-term vision. We already started to work on it and we hope to establish a platform uh, together with the help in, with the Balvanatic Center uh, that will help us with, with such a, a procedure, which is quite challenging. Let me go put back to the GSK3 size. Uh, and as I mentioned, or on the previous slide, um, the procedure or our way or strategy to develop Psi uh, inhibitor for GSK3 was uh, uh, based on two things, one on the substrate, on the GSK3 substrate complex, and the other is on the recognition motif of the enzyme. And this is something I should explain. Any protein kinase has a recognition motif, which is a stretch of amino acid that it likes to phosphorylate. And each kinase has a different recognition motif. So what we do, we actually combine this information together in order to build or to design optimized peptides. So what you have here, we have the three, uh, 3D structure of GSK3 and a peptide called CREB that docked into GSK3. We were able to map the sites by biochemical analysis that were also proven or supported with computational analysis. And what you can see here is that we identify important sites for binding. One of them is, for example, the phosphate binding pocket that was identified by 3D structure. This one interacts with the phosphorylated serine, which is a part of the recognition motif of GSK3. The others are sites that we identified, for example, what we call the 8999 loop, and especially uh, phenylalanine F93, which is very important for substrate binding, and we also have here the hydrophobic patch. So all in all, we have our peptide. Our first one, generation peptide is L803. You can see here the docking of the L803 into uh, uh, the GSK3, and we could really show that it interacts very nicely into the uh, sites that we identified. Now, when we look on the peptide, we predicted or we thought that if we increase the affinity or if they increase the interaction of the peptide with the F93, maybe we get a better peptide. So by computational uh, simulation, we really could show that if we added F, and now we call the peptide L803F, indeed there is a strong interaction with the F93. But of course the experimental results are the most important results, and you can see that as compared to L803Mets, the L803F really, really improved and actually reduced from 20 micromolar IC50 to something around, or to one digit micromolar IC50, which is a big improvement in terms of the peptide inhibition. 
We also develop another peptide, the LA26 max, on the same rationale that I showed you in the previous slide. And you can see here that we um, really uh, improved uh, the potency of our inhibitors. Now, recently we identified a new modality of cyanibition, inhibition, and we are now using it to develop even better and better inhibitors because the modality of inhibition is really different. What you can see here is, uh, of course, the substrate, it is phosphorylate, and then it dissociated from uh, the kinase. I'm just showing you the type of inhibition. So one type of inhibition that we extensively use, and other people try to do it, is what we call the pseudo substrate. And actually, these are peptides or substrates that are not able to be phosphorylated, but they can still interact with the kinase. So this cell or substrate interacts with the catalytic domain of the kinase. It cannot be phosphorylated, so it's stuck there. And these are the kind of the inhibitors that we initially had, the LA23, the LA23FF, and the LA26, and others that are cell or substrate. The new modality of inhibition that we found, and actually, I think it's, it's the first one that was shown for protein kinases, and in enzyme, perhaps in general, is what we call substrate converted into inhibitor. What we found, and actually by accident, that if we use certain substrate, they are phosphorylated by the enzyme or by GSK3, but then after they are phosphorylated, they, are, they remain uh, in, uh, bound to the, to the kinase that are not dissociated. And if you look on the structure models, you can understand why. If you look here on the LA23F, you see that this is the phosphorylation, which is part of the recognition motif. This is the new peptide inhibitor, the LA27, that became phosphorylated. So you see here double phosphorylation here. And what we found that after the LA27 is phosphorylated, its conformation is turned, it's bound, and the two phosphorylated sites are now interact very tightly with the phosphate binding pocket. And that's what you get a very, very potent uh, inhibitor. So just to show that this is uh, not a, a, a unique example, we synthesize additional peptides on the same idea of subset converted into inhibitor. So now we have the L808, the L809. As you can see that the IC50 really reduced from one to 700, and we now get something around 50 nanomolar IC50, which is very similar to small molecules. So we get a really potent uh, inhibitors. Now, what about uh, selectivity? So we tested uh, uh, many of those inhibitors, and uh, there were, for example, the L8 or 7 were tested against 150 protein kinases, and you can see here, the GSK3 is very nicely inhibited by the L8 or 7, but all the 150 protein kinases were not inhibited. So we have a potent inhibitor. It's highly selective. You remember that's why we initially started to think about size. And if we're talking about uh, safety, uh, we're now doing some tox analysis in animals and in cells. I just want to show an example. If, for example, we take a, a human uh, mesenchymal cells, and we uh, kindly got it from Shimon Efrat in our department, so if they uh, tried the ATP competitive inhibitors, as you can see, it really was very toxic. It killed the cells. But if we used our size, for example, the L807, the cells were still viable, as you can see here in the bar graph. We also do some safety analysis in animals. We inject uh, tenfold doses of the LA207 mets and others. And here I show you one example. We are just measuring body weight. So we, sh we, we can see or show that our psi peptides are uh, not toxic and quite safe. So what I showed you so far that the, uh, about the size strategy, that first of all, we are, we are able to do it. We have some rationale to do it. And that they do prove themselves in terms of selectivity, uh, potency, and safety, as opposed to those small ATP competitive inhibitors that uh, uh, have some problems. I just want to shift now to the GSK3 and to what the kind of results that we have with the GSK3 inhibitors. Just briefly show you that GSK3 is now believed to be an important drug discovery target. It uh, regulates or it's a part of uh, uh, many diseases, in particular CNS diseases, uh, due to phosphorylation of important target and uh, interaction. But many, I should say, the GSK3 is involved in neurodegeneration, um, in inflammation, and uh, recently we also showed that it's affecting uh, protein clearance by affecting lysosomes and autophagy. And therefore, uh, the dogma or the concept that inhibition of GSK3 may be a therapeutic uh, approach 
uh, is, is, uh, is thought is valid and uh, there are many nice results, not, not only from our lab, but also from others. Just a bit about mechanism and uh, here, for example, with Alzheimer's disease, so you can see that hyperactivity of GSK3 can be connected to important pathways that contribute to AD, for example, typhosphorylation, APP processing and uh, regulation of BAC1, activation of pro-inflammatory factors, and of course, the clearance activity, a particular lysosome that we now we know show the GSK3 effect lysosome, and all in all, it will lead to accumulation of neurotoxin protein, such as beta amyloids, and we think that it's also connected to other neurodegenerative disorders, for example, Huntington, ALS, and others, because it can affect the accumulation of a, a neurotoxin protein. I will show you two examples of uh, in vivo model that we used with the, our new inhibitor, the L807. One is the Alzheimer's disease. I don't think I need to explain uh, about the disease, but uh, uh, this is a disease where uh, it's an age-related disease, and it's increasing with time in terms of number of patients, and we expect that in 200, uh, uh, 2030, we will have around 50 million Alzheimer's patients. And therefore, uh, uh, there is a desperate need for a cure, for therapy. There are several FDA-approved drugs, as you can see here, but they really do not have really an effective uh, therapy or clinical uh, um, success. So due to the rationale of the GSK3, as I showed you before, we, we tried uh, uh, to test um, Alzheimer's disease model. Uh, we're using several models, just show results with the 5XFAD model, and very briefly, these mice are transgenic mice, and they express very rapidly a beta amyloid aggregate, as you can see here. They also show neurodegeneration and problem in cognitive functions. So what we are doing at the age of two months, we start to treat with our L807 mets, with our GSK3 inhibitors, and then when the mice are six months old, we look at brain pathology and behavior tests. So in terms of, uh, uh, I hope you see it, can you reduce the lights. In terms of brain pathology, what you can see here, a uh, brain section where we stand for beta amyloid. So you can see the treatment with the L807 mets uh, indeed reduce the beta amyloid aggregates. If you don't see it, just uh, believe it. We see very nice, a significant reduction in beta amyloid aggregates. We also looked for inflammation, and this is a GFAP staining, staining astrocytes. And again, you see um, the abundance of many astrocytes in the non-treated animals, while we saw a significant reduction in astrocytes with the treated animals. We also did some behavior analysis. I'll really briefly go through it, um, just showing the principles. One uh, uh, behavior, for example, is fear conditioning. It's looking for memory. You have uh, uh, give electric shock to the mice, and then you measure uh, next time if the mice remember the electric shock, it's uh, it's, fr it's freezing on its uh, uh, on this position. And what you can see that the treated mice indeed remember the electric shock and froze as compared to the non-treated. We also do some ob objective uh, recognition test, and in this test we uh, measure or we test if the mouse can identify a new object. Usually a normal mouse will be more curious and go to the new object. Alzheimer's mouse will not recognize between the two objects if you replace them. And indeed we can see that the treated mice, we get a very nice reverse in the cognitive decline. They do identify the, uh, the new object in two different sessions, which again show that we have improvement in cognitive function. The other uh, test that we do is social interaction. And we know that there is a problem sociability in Alzheimer's people, but also GSK3 is involved in sociability. And what we measure here is the time that the mouse preferred to spend with a stranger mouse. And uh, uh, shortly I can say that the, the treated mouse indeed uh, spent more time near the stranger mouse. So all in all, we could show with LA27 meds, but also with the, the other inhibitor that they had, LA23, that if we treat the Alzheimer's uh, mice, we get improvement, both in reduction in beta amyloid, which we believe is due to the clearance activity that I explained before, and also in cognitive function. I want to show a very recent result that we have in Huntington models. These are the, R60, uh, the R62 mice, and these mice uh, express the Huntington 
mutant. The Huntington mutant is the protein which you have a, a poly-Q or polyglycine, and therefore the Huntington tends to aggregate, especially in the striatum, in the brain. And these aggregates are very toxic to neurons, and, uh, uh, and they cause a lot of problems. Uh, part of them are, for example, motor behavior and mobility. And there is no cure or no really therapy for Huntington. What you can see here are uh, the wild type animals compared to R62. We just measure uh, several parameters, for example, in body weight. Just follow the red arrow so you can see that the R62 animals have reduced body weight. If you look on rotor rod, this is the ability to, to walk on a rotor rod. You see that they have really problem in mobility. And clasping, as you can see here, and, Hunt, and Huntington model tends to clasp all its four limbs, while the wild type animal uh, uh, tends to spread the limbs. So they get a score, and you see that the sick animals have a very high score. They tend to uh, clasp. Also, we can go and, and look for brain section, look for HD antigrad. These are brain sections stained with the Huntington uh, uh, antibody, and we get a very nice, or we, we get some aggregation. So again, we, we take the animals and we treat them at the age of four weeks. Uh, we treat them to L8 to 7 mets. I didn't mention that, but we prefer to use the intranasal delivery. We just sniff the, uh, the uh, inhibitors into the mice. And we could do two things. First of all, in terms of pathology, this is kind of preliminary results. We didn't finish the, the whole experiment. But we could definitely see that the treatment with the GSK3 inhibitor reduced the Huntington aggregate. But really what was really striking that the treatment with the L807 mets improved the mobility and the gait of the animals. What you can see here on the left is what we call a regulatory index, which measure, you, you measure uh, uh, the gait or the walking of the animal in an apparatus called catwalk, and it really uh, uh, integrates all the data of the walking to an index, which means if the mice walk abnormal or normal, and as you can see, the non for example, the non treated cells as compared to wild type animal, these are the black the, uh, animals. There is a reduction in the regulatory index as expected, but in the treated animals, there is a really nice improvement. And you can follow here on the steps. You can see here four lanes, which are step of each foot. And you can see that the sick animal has some broken, you can see broken step, which means that they, have very, they really suffer and they have really problem to put their feet on the plates while uh, the L807 uh, met treated animals, there was a significant improvement. I want to show you uh, the slide. You, you will see how the animals walk. What you see here is the wild type animal. They walk very nicely. And now I'll show you uh, the non-treated animals, the R62. And this is um, a movie taken in the catwalk. You just let the animal walk on the plate and uh, um, it's walking, um, it's monitored. And this is our treated animals. And as you can see, all those parameters are actually calculated, integrated into the regulatory index. So we can definitely say that our treated animals have more confidence in their uh, walking and uh, we really improve their uh, mobility. Finally, um, I just want to show you the beginning of, of our size strategy to our small molecules. So as I explained the first slide, we have our model of the GSK3 with one of its peptides, in this case the LHO3F. Uh, then we design a pharmacophore based on this structure, we do virtual screening, on li available libraries, and then we do some of the testing. So actually what we did is three rounds, and that's what you see the first result that we have. So in the first round, we purchased something around 10 to 12 molecules, and we have three compounds with IC50 around 100 micromolar. Then we took the three compounds and searched for analogs, and again, uh, we, we searched, we did the, the screening again, uh, purchased 22 molecules and tested, and actually there was an improvement. Now uh, we have IC50 around 20 micromolar. And then we did a third run. Again, we took the two molecules that we found best, 
and again did the uh, uh, searching for analogs and we got to a very nice result in my opinion that we have three molecules with one digit micromolar IC50, something around five micromolar. And what you can see here is a detailed IC50 of the three molecules that we found. Of course, this is the beginning, but uh, uh, we think that we have uh, psi small molecules, and this is something really new uh, for protein kinases. They have reasonable uh, IC50, and of course, the next step is to uh, do more biological testing in terms of uh, perhaps testing them in, in animals, but of course, continue with medicinal chemistry and uh, developing or synthesizes uh, novel molecules. Um, this is, in a way, where we are in terms of drug discovery and development. We have the side peptide that what we need now to do is toxicity and safety in big animals, and we have the, the psi uh, molecules, which are now in the discovery stage. And I'd just like to thank uh, my current laboratory, but of course there are some PhD students that finished and left, uh, like Limor and Tali, that contributed a lot. And my collaborator, Richard Dopp, that did uh, some studies in fragile X and multiple sclerosis. Hanok Senderovich is helping us with the computational analysis. And Mickey, Miri Eisenstein, if you see all these beautiful structures, um, this is the work of Miri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hagit.